Hello, this is Angelica Yingst, and you're listening to Centered, Grounded Conversations About the Metaphysical. Hello, welcome to Centered. I am Angelica Yingst, your cruise director. So today is a solo episode. I'm doing another Q&A episode. I'm going to try to do these at least once a month because I love questions. I've been answering questions at my job at Hibiscus Moon Crystal Academy for the past eight years. I do think my perfect job would be a travel writer and an advice columnist. So if anyone's willing to pay me to travel around the world and write about it and then ask me questions, I'm here for it. Okay, I'm here. Uh, Just saying. But no one's asked me to do that at any rate. If you're friends with me on Facebook or you follow my page on Facebook, I will put up an Ask Me Anything meme. Um, I'll put one up on Instagram. You can submit questions under that. You can send me an email about questions. You can record a comment or question on my anchor page, which I love. Um, I love hearing your voices. I'm probably best at answering questions about crystals, earth medicine, tarot, recovery, um, healing work, different religions. I have a degree in religions and a lot of people don't know about like religions. And I think everyone knows everything about religions because I'm so interested in religions, Uh, philosophy, uh, you know, just some of the weird things that come up for us when we're doing this woo-woo work. Sometimes we just like don't know what someone's trying to say when they're using all these woo-woo terms. So that's one. Uh, Mindful parenting is another, you know, I can, I'll answer questions about pretty much anything. And if I don't know or don't feel qualified to talk about it, I will just say, sorry, I'm not qualified to talk about that. So I will kind of set those boundaries. But I do love answering questions. I'm dedicated to teaching and furthering people's spiritual journeys. I also want to like elucidate anything I take for granted. And that's really what these Q&A episodes are about is to kind of like get back on track if you feel confused about something I'm talking about or something that you've read out there in the community. If you are really interested in having some one-on-one time with me and working with me and, and learning from me, I do readings at the full moon, new moon. I do shamanic journeys every month in my private Facebook group called the Moon and Stone Membership Group. It's $20 a month. You get all those readings. Uh, You get the journey every month with one different animal, new moon reading and a full moon reading. I do readings at all of the uh, eight points in the wheel of the year. I also do a coffee and cards Uh, Zoom meeting every week with all those people and you can come in and get a card pulled for the weekend, for the week. And it's really great. I answer questions. We just chit chat and have a really good time. Um, And everyone's equal in there. I'm not just like teaching to a blank screen. We're all kind of talking. So some of those people in there are taking my tarot class. So they ask a lot of tarot questions. Other people are interested in shamanic journeys. So they ask journey questions. We talk about dream interpretation it's really, really fun. You can go to my website, angieyinks.com or themoonandstone.com to learn more. But thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoy this solo episode of Centered. Suzanne asked this question, is there a card that is always a little difficult to interpret when it comes up in a tarot reading? Conversely, Is there one or multiple that are easier? So it's interesting because I think this question is different for every single person. Like there's always cards that challenge people. And when I'm in tarot class and I'm teaching people about the cards, some people are like, oh, I hate that card, you know, or I love that card. I think, you know, one of the things about this is just like looking at why. For me, I used to really dread getting the two of wands and the three of wands, especially if they came together in the same reading, which they always seem to do. And because they they sort of look the same to me, they represented the same thing to me, no matter how many books I studied, no matter how much I read about it, I just found them to be like, bleh, boring, hard to read. And part of it is because they have very similar imagery. The two of wands has a guy standing on his castle top holding one wand and holding the earth and, you know, the world or a globe in his hand. And he's looking out over supposedly his kingdom or whatever. 
And um, he, you know, I just used to say like, okay, he's, you know, contemplating what to do. And then the three has a similar one. There's three wands. Now he's overlooking and you see these ships going out to sea. And um, I used to just get sort of caught up in just how like, uh, it's time to look at the future, think about the future, blah, 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 blah. Um, Now I kind of, because I used to struggle with them so much, I really started to look at the imagery and, and get into it. So I think for, for me, like all those cards that are hard to, to interpret sometimes, I've gone like on deep dives with and tried to become intimate with. So for the two now, I see him kind of looking at his past because that's all he has. He's sort of new on this like empire building mission that he has and that can mean anything for people it can be hey i'm starting out my job and i'm contemplating like where to go i don't know where i should point to so for me now the two is just about making a decision where to put your energy and so you're only kind of looking at what you've been through it's like you're using your experience as the way to make a decision and um and this gets kind of into like what do i like to read um, I love to read questions where people ask me, I need to make a decision. I have this this path to go down or this path to go down. Um, and I love doing those kind of readings because I will pull a card for one choice and then pull, or I shouldn't say a card, I pull a whole reading for one choice and another reading for the other choice. And I keep them exactly the same. Like I try to make them like, if I'm going to do a four card pool for that, I do four cards on both sides because then that person can now make an informed choice about what the energy would be like if they choose this path or what the energy would be like if they choose the other path. And I think that tarot is really great at elucidating, elucidating the differences because often like when we meditate or ask spirit, like which choice should I made, make? spirits like it doesn't matter you're still going to get to the same spiritual place so you want to see what is that path like and what is this path like you know you're going to make meaning out of it because that's what humans do we make meaning out of our experiences so but looking at the energy like okay this is the same old same old if you go down this path and this is new and bright and exciting and creative in this path you may get to the same place but the boring path is going to be longer and more boring, right? <laughs> so you kind of want to do that. So with the two and, you know, the two, I like that ability now to say like, okay, you're making a choice. And then three is basically like you made the choice. Now you're letting everything go and there's growth happening. So I take the two and the three, like you are growing from a decision you made in the three. So, you know, one of the things like I, don't really struggle to interpret any one card anymore. Um, the hangman is always a hard one for everyone, partially because, and this is something that um, Rachel uh, Pollock talks about in her book, her books. She basically says like, maybe part of the hangman is to be a paradox. Like you have this guy who's purposefully hung himself upside down to get a different perspective. So he's, he's uncomfortable. He's hung by one foot, which cannot be cool. Like that doesn't feel good. It's like you're separating your ankle from your leg, but he's like achieving enlightenment. He has that corona of enlightenment around his head. So he's looking for a different perspective, but like what that sacrifice is, is hard to tell. It's hard to say like, oh, it's definitely this sacrifice. So she says, you know, Rachel Pollock says, like, maybe part of the energy of the hangman is to not understand the hangman, that, you know, this paradox comes and we can only really see it in retrospective, how that was our sacrifice and what we gained from that. So I think that can be a hard one. But, you know, for general readings, I think it's always difficult to communicate a general feeling or or reading that shows that the person is sabotaging their own happiness or that they're stuck in a loop that they can't get out of because you can tell them in a thousand ways but that has to be an internal change you know and you can see those cards coming like that i'm doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results especially when someone's in a relationship with someone who's toxic or who needs to be alone or they need to be alone. Those can be really difficult 
questions and readings to kind of come through. Especially like when you see the cards like the Tower and the Eight of Swords and swords in general can really be difficult to pass on to your clients because often the swords are about your own perception, your own self-sabotaging. So you don't want to scare them and make people feel like shit by telling them like, oh, you're sabotaging yourself. I mean, I always want to empower people to take the reins and change things on their own before everything comes down around them crashing. The tower has a reputation of being really unexpected change in chaos, like the car breaking down or you losing your job or you find your, out your partner's cheating. But when you really, really look at them, those things, there's often a lot of warning signs that we ignore. Oh, yeah, my check engine light has been on for three months and I was going to take it when I got my car inspected the next time, you know. Or, um, yeah, you know, my husband's been spending a lot of time doing X, Y, and Z, and I was trying to ignore the fact that he wasn't present. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we see all these things, these warning signs. So the tower often comes when, like, hey, you've ignored all of my warning signs. Now everything's coming crashing down. And I don't like to tell people fate is happening and everything's going to come to shit so that you change. <laughs> That that can be really difficult. But, it, you know, the way I always do is like, this is a card of, of change, of things crashing down. And like, you get to decide if you pull that down consciously before it happens or not. So, I mean, I try to turn it, but those are always challenging. John said, stage cards confuse me, and it would be amazing if you could talk about how to integrate after shadow work, which I love. And then um, there was a question like, what are stage cards? I don't understand what that is, and blah, blah, blah. So let me just talk from the beginning about what stage cards are in the tarot. Okay, first and foremost, I think to understand stage cards, we're going to talk a little bit about Pamela Coleman Smith. And just bear with me, this is a long one, but um, so Arthur Waite wrote that Pamela Coleman Smith is a most imaginative and abnormally psychic artist. And Arthur Waite, if you don't know, is the one who commissioned Pamela Coleman Smith to draw the Rider Waite deck, which is how it was known for a long time. We now call it the Rider Waite Smith deck to acknowledge Pamela Coleman Smith's artwork because she did do so, so much. So the Rider Waite Smith deck was published in 1909. Ryder was the publisher, Arthur Waite was the writer and the commissioner of the deck, and Smith, Pamela Coleman Smith, was the artist. So in her personal writings, uh, Pamela Coleman Smith said that this project was a big job for very little cash. I mean, she had six months to paint 80 cards is what she was commissioned to do. It ended up being 78 in the deck, but that was what she was commissioned to do. Um, and, you know, most of the time her names have been left off of the deck. And now you're seeing a move towards mentioning her a little more. And part of those erasures come with the idea of Pamela Coleman Smith herself. She was uh, a queer woman. She was, from what we, can, what we know of her, um, she was mixed race. And, um, you know, I don't think she would call herself a lesbian, but she had a lot of romantic relationships with other women. So Pamela Coleman Smith gave really rich depictions and levels to the card. And if you want to hear more about this, you can listen to this episode that Kira and I recently did on gender in the writer Wait Smith deck, because Pamela Coleman Smith painted a lot of androgynous faces because the models she were she was using were actors, men dressed up like women um, in like you know, theater. That was what was happening at the time. So uh, Pamela Coleman Smith was named, they called her Pixie, and she was born in 1878, and she lived to 1951, which, like, side note, does not seem that long ago, <laughs> since that was the year my dad was born. But um, she was born in London to an American merchant who had a job between London and Jamaica. So her mother was Corinne Coleman, a sister the sister to the painter Samuel Coleman. And so the mixed race part comes in that, you know, Corinne Coleman and Samuel Coleman were mixed race. Um, so 
Pamela Coleman Smith had like almost a multiracial look to her. Like um, Yates thought she was Japanese, for example. Um, and that's interesting. People thought she was black. People thought she was white. Like she just kind of moved in between a lot of different communities. And that's interesting about her. So she actually moved to New York City and attended Pratt Institute when her mother died, she went back to Jamaica and then kind of moved between London, Jamaica, and New York City. One of her first post-school illustration projects was the Illustrated Verses by William Butler Yeats. And it was during that period that she started like illustrating, illustrating folklore books. And, and she also began touring with the Lyceum Theater Group to illustrate a book by Bram Stoker. Uh, about an actress. So anyway, she traveled with them. She did set design. She did costume design. In addition, uh, she worked on her own illustrations. And it was in that theater group that they started calling her Pixie. So Yates introduced her to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is how she met Arthur Waite. When the order split, which it did quite a few times, <laughs> it was very drama filled. Let me, let's put it that way. Uh, Smith moved with weight to the Holy Order of the Golden Dawn. So in 1909, Waite commissioned the tarot deck with the intention that it would be an artistic rendition of these ideas that they played with in the Hermetic Order, or the Holy Order of the Golden Dawn. So the, de the, the deck was just called the writer deck, and then Waite put himself into it, and now, now we're talking about Pixie. So Pixie was the one who was painting the deck um, at the same time that she also was doing theater design. So she's working on sets and costumes. And many believe the stage cards, now we're back to stage cards, sorry about that, are influenced by her theatrical background. So Arthur Waite instructed her to design the major arcana and the minor arcana. Now, the major arcana had existed from the 14th century in Italy, from the first Tarocini decks, or Tarocini decks, however you want to pronounce it. So at that time, you know, these decks were um, painted, hand painted by artists for different families. So if the Medici family wanted a Tarocini deck, this artist would be commissioned to draw all of the the 22 major arcana and they would draw it like with the matriarch in it. So like the empress would be whoever the mother was in that family and the father would be, but they had similar uh they had all the same cards, like the sun depicted usually that baby riding on a horse, and the 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 strength card had a woman with a lion, for example. Those were all codified by you know the the 14th century Italian Terracini painters. So when Arthur Waite instructed her with the major arcanas, basically gave her a deck of this Terracini cards. So. The minor arcana, though, the pips, that's what we call the pips, the one to 10. So you have those pips were not ever depicted as a scene until the Rider Waite Smith deck. Pixie's the one who came up with that. So when he instructed her to paint the minor arcana, he basically said, like, okay, here's the idea of it, one word. So she basically designed the minors. And so that's why many people say like in each suit, you can see the growth and there's a story and Pixie had a story in her head. It wasn't like Arthur Waite gave her that story. And this is where her real psychic intuitive stuff came out. So when you see the, the deck and you put one to 10 in each suit, this is a great way to learn them is like kind of understand like what, like put yourself in the scene. What was Pixie trying to communicate here? So instead of just having like six swords, she then showed this guy riding it victorious through a, a you know, or sorry, that's the six of wands. Sorry. Um, the six of wands that shows this, you know, victor victory um, after the five. Okay. So, she really brought to life the minor arcana and she really is responsible. So when you think about like what did Pixie herself, this artist, bring to this deck, one of the things she brought was the theater. Okay. So that's why, you know, you have 
justice being very, you know, androgynous or the, the um, uh, hierophant being androgynous because there was no sexuality to them. They're supposed to be free of that, free of, you know, the confines of like attraction and love and all that stuff. So what Pamela Coleman Smith brought to the minor arcana is this idea of the stage. So what are the stage cards? These are cards where the scene depicted on the card appears to resemble a stage backdrop. OK, so what you will often see are like two lines that show like the smooth place where the character is standing, because remember, like when you build a set, you often will be on stage. Right. So there's no. You know, stones, there's no rocks, there's no grass, it's just flat and easy to walk on. And then the backdrop shows all the drama. OK, so those are the stage cards and the figures on the cards don't seem to be part of what's going on behind them. So the foreground is plain and flat, sometimes colorless or like very tan or gray in comparison to the background. And so when you're doing this, like a lot of times tarot re readers and teachers don't even talk about this. They don't talk about stage cards because not every person uses that aspect. They just take the card as is. And I honestly don't use it every time I do. I do look at the reading at hand. So it's just that sometimes the stage seems really important and sometimes it doesn't. So when Pixie painted some of these cards and not all of them, but some of them where it looks like they're on stage, why? What was she trying to communicate to you? What she was trying to communicate, I think, is that the scene might be a performance. That that person's trying to show you something so that you believe them right? You believe that something's happening to them. So the idea with some of these stage cards is that the scene is only, quote unquote, an act. Like this is an act for you to understand. So I think a great one to use an example is the two of pentacles, which shows a juggler with two pentacles. There's an affinity sign around them and he's juggling them. And there's like a comically rough sea behind him. Like it looks ridiculous. And it's showing a boat that most certainly would have capsized in real life. And he's juggling these two coins. Now, generally, when we look at this card, we think, oh, this is someone who is juggling life, you know, like between work and home life and, you know, what he wants to do, what he has to do and blah, 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 blah. Okay. But when you see it on stage, what is the additional meaning of that? It means that he wants you to believe that he's balancing all these things with some inner esoteric knowledge or wisdom. That's what the infinity symbol always represents. And that he's doing it with grace and coolness despite everything looking crazy behind him. So if he's on stage pretending, who's he pretending to? Well, an audience, okay? So he wants the audience to believe that he is the one on a boat that's balancing all this stuff. But of course he can juggle very easily because he's on flat ground on a stage on the earth not in, you know, on a ship. So, you know, that idea that he's just trying to make himself look good, that this is all a big act, is that he's actually overwhelmed and overburdened. So stage cards show people who seem to be separate. And unlike other designations, like major arcana, minor arcana, court cards, even the challenge cards or triumph cards, stage cards aren't always agreed upon. The general rule is that the stage card is identified by a double line that goes across the card, separating the figures in the foreground from the background. So with stage cards, like all of the work of the tarot, I think you could get really caught up in just that aspect of it. And this is where I think, you know, intuition and psychic abilities come in, because when we're reading for someone, we have to think about not think about, but we have to like experience what's popping out at us as important. So when that double line like jumps out at you and you're like, oh man, this person's on stage, it's not actually like as is, then you can kind of use that stage card aspect of it. When I see stage cards, I often think about like what could be going on. So here's some good questions with stage cards. Could it be that someone's putting on a show? as in being performatives or straight up lying. 
And again, you're looking at other cards around it. So cards like the, the seven of uh, swords would be a really important one. Okay. So is this person lying? Are they just trying to show me something? Are they separate from what's going on around them? How? Is there anything um, that is in this card that would indicate that the person isn't being honest with themselves? Um, are the people in uh, a play, so to speak, like, for example, the 10 of cups has the happy family, like they're all dancing around and they look like they're on a stage. So are like they pretending to be on a stage or like pretending to be a happy family and not really? I generally just see that as a happy family card. I don't think of it as a stage card, but you could interpret it that way based on the other things around. I also would look at like, is this a facade or a mask that's dropped after the curtains close, right? Is the situation real? Is it an illusion? And if it's illusion, why are they bothering to try to make you believe whatever's going on there? So, you know, we're kind of looking at like the representations. And then also like, is this about the person asking the question or like other people showing off? So, you know, sometimes those, like the martyr card, for example, isn't exactly a stage card, but that is like this feeling of like, oh, I'm just a Vic, I'm just a, doing all of this for everyone else. And we can like look at the other cards, right? So a lot of times, you know, when we're getting all, like we're seeing all the stage cards, that might be a time where you think, okay, something's going on here that they're fooling themselves. And they're not quite even acknowledging that this is all a show. And what do they really want? You know, the thing about tarot that, that gets, like, people always joke about, is like, tarot calls you out, man. And the stage cards are one of the ways that it can call you out. So, you know, a lot of times when we're working with stage cards, it's, it's basically saying, like, this role that you're putting on is keeping you from intimacy. Like all of this showmanship is keeping you from real connection, from being honestly loved, liked, and helped. Like we can't be vulnerable that way. And I think we're all guilty of like stage performances at times, right? We can stage situations and events to impress people. And like social media is perfect for that, right? But we see that all the time, people showing you one thing, you know, like I, you know, I can think of some people that like every time they're with that, a person, they take a picture and it's one of those things like, okay, you know, do they see each other every day or just like once a year and they're always taking a picture and putting it up because they want to be seen with that person, right? So think about this as like, this is a selfie. Okay. And again, not every single time. And that's what gets so confusing about the tarot is that all these cards have so many different meanings. They have so much to tell us that we get to use, we, you know, our intuitive ability comes like you could learn every single aspect of a card, but it's not going to help you in a reading unless you use your intuition about what's going on with this one person at this one time at you know, asking this one question. So that's where it gets really confusing. So um, I think like for me, when I look at a stage card, I want to think about like, why? Why would this be staged right now? And is this relevant to the question being asked? That's kind of like how I would start discerning. But, you know, I think the stage cards really give us an ability to comp comprehend and contemplate how we play roles in our life and how they can be performative and whether there's self-deception or self-sabotage happening because of the roles we play. Now, a, a lot of the twos are stage cards because stu twos are balancing nature. And sometimes this is like a fake it till you make it kind of thing. So you can kind of feel that energy with it, you know. Um, and they're not always bad. Like none of the aces are stage cards. Um, you know, very few of the threes are stage cards, if any. Now I'm thinking about it. You know, so just thinking about that. 
something like the four of wands, which is the card of like marriages and rites of passage, like that is obviously a stage card. You're doing this performance because you're doing a ritual of moving from one phase to the other. And that's a positive thing. It's always a good thing. So kind of looking at that a little deeper. Now, Arthur Waite, who commissioned this deck, never, ever talked about stage cards. And I just want you to know that this is something that um, I, I believe um, Rachel Pollack started like in the 80s or 70s or whatever. She really noticed that. And then we put, we, you know, we look back at this. Did Pixie really understand that she was drawing a stage and putting people on a stage? Or was she just so used to looking at the world that way? that she, you know, put some people on stage because she didn't know how to put them, you know. I happen to believe she was very, very conscious of the fact that she was putting people on stage and having them be a, in a performance because that changes the meaning. But, you know, that's me projecting, like, what I think Pixie's conscious thoughts were. And I think a lot of this was very, very intuitive. So, you know, whether you use stage cards or not is not going to change a ton about your reading. You can get all that information from the cards themselves. So if you just want to ignore all the stage cards when you're reading tarot, that's awesome. But that's my little rant and history lesson about the stage cards. So I have a couple questions about astrology and planets and retrogrades and the moon. And so I'm going to kind of combine them. And I'll start with Danielle's first question, which is, can you talk about the phases of the moon, the spiritual meaning to the spiritual phases most of us experience in life? So that's a really huge question. I actually do a class on that. <laughs> um, but I do, I will talk a little bit about this. So working with the moon um, for diff the different phases can be really important. So we kind of think of the new moon as the beginning of the moon cycle. Okay. So the, the new moon begins when there is the smallest crescent of the moon's waning period. And that moves into the smallest crescent of the moon's waxing period, which is a, basically a three day period. So if you say the new moon is on the, what is it this month? Um, the, the, eighth no no the 23rd that means the 22nd the 23rd and 24th is considered the new moon period okay during that period this is when we do the spiritual and magical work of renewal and release so we plant seeds in the agrarian uh approach you would plant seeds in the garden at the new moon but this is a time spiritually when we can plant new ideas, projects, intentions, manifestation. We create our altars and our grids. We call in. Okay. So a lot of the work that we do is either calling in or releasing. So during the new moon, we're calling in. So you can start a new business, call in new habits, uh, family, uh, new friendships, relationships. This is a great time for divination work. It's a great time for grounding and protection work. Now, months with two new moons, the second one is called the black moon. And the second one is considered more powerful and a time when spells manifest a little more quickly. Now, the dark moon is the period with no direct sunlight and that lasts 21 to 26 hours. And that's that time when we say this is the new moon, <laughs> okay? Um, but the dark moon is considered great for stillness work. We do banishing work at that time. We do protection work. We do uh, clearing out enemies, illness, poverty. Sometimes baneful magic is done at the dark moon. Um, but, you know, we're kind of working with shadow at that time. Now, as the new moon progresses and moves through, we go into the waxing moon phase. And the waxing moon period includes the two weeks between the new moon and the full moon. And this is when the moon's light grows. And it is said that so does your fortune. Okay. This is a great time to connect with any growth work, any expansion work. I want to build my business. I want to build my relationship. I want to build my uh, self-love. It's a great time to connect with animal medicine and elemental work. Um, so it's all about growth. So growing a business, like I said, drawing new people to you, building friendships, encouraging prosperity, 
we work with these ideas of courage and motivation and inspiration and patience and healing. So we're growing. Then we're moving towards the full moon period. Now, within that um, new moon, that that waxing period, okay, we call it the waxing moon. We have the waxing crescent. Then we have the first quarter moon in the waxing moon. That's great for spells of growth, courage, motivation. We do abundance work, build momentum. Then we move into the waxing gib gibbous period. And then we go to the full moon time. Now, the full moon time is also a period that lasts three days. On the middle day, the moon is at its widest, fullest light. That would be the day and time that people give you for the full moon in your area. Okay, so Eastern Standard Time is going to have a different time of the full moon than Pacific Time. Okay, the full moon is when the moon is at its widest and fullest, but the full moon period is the three days, the day before, the full moon day, and the day after. So you can do all that spell work within that three-day period. The full moon is a time of culmination and harvest. So you often have the most clarity during this phase. So you know what goals you're working with, what steps need to be taken. We often see also all the shadow stuff coming to light, which means like when we set an intention at the new moon and we see it grow through the waxing, at the full moon, we should see what's blocking us from getting that intention, okay? Because often intention work isn't about calling in a ton of new stuff. It's usually about releasing the thing that's blocking us from making that happen, okay? So the full moon's a really good time for releasing, okay? And we do a lot of releasing work at that time. But this is also a great time for your magical, spiritual, and healing work to be around spirituality, protection, drawing down the moon, healing work, psychic power and divination, decision-making, luck, success, and change. When there's two full moons in a month, the second one is called the blue moon. The second one is also considered more powerful. Spells manifest more quickly. Now, there's 13 full moons in a year. So you know that, you know, blue moons happen. They're going to happen. And usually that's why, you know, we have this changing time. Like you don't always have the full moon on the same day of the month every year, every month, right? You don't have it on the 15th every month. It changes because it's a 28-day cycle, okay? Now, the full moon period is the period most people think of as like this harvest time, you know? That's when we're picking the fruits of our intention. Okay, the waning period is between the full moon and new moon, which again is another two-week period, and this time is the time to do more releasing and banishing smell spells. We're letting go. So we're doing, you know, grids to let go of stuff we're not needing anymore. We can do losing weight spells, uh, releasing habit spells, breakups and endings. We can do transition spells. We can just release, you know, pain, release anger, release whatever. We have a lot of awareness during this time. And this is as, as the moon kind of goes back to new and we're waning, we're removing our obstacles, but we're going more inward, okay? So you can think of the waxing moon period when we're building to the full moon as being extroverted. This is moving inward and doing introverted work, okay? So when we do our magical work and you think about, okay, this is a full moon in whatever, full moon in Aries, full moon in Taurus, you can think about like some of those moons are better for different things. So when you have a full moon or a moon in Aries, Aries is a fire sign ruled by Mars and that's initiative action impulses. This is a time to perform protection rituals. Now this could be new moon or full moon, uh, rituals for control, power, strength, lust, and sex. Okay. With Taurus, that's an earth sign ruled by Venus. So those are times to perform rituals around relationships and money. And so, you know, because Taurus is a fixed sign, they're usually really positive and they get, you know, really good and grounded. They're really highly effective at that time if you work with it. Gemini is an air sign and it has a dualistic nature. So this is sometimes difficult uh, to work with in terms of controlling the direction of your spell work, intention work, or magical work, but it does present an opportunity to do rituals around creativity, ideas, and travel. 
Okay. Just know that it shifts. Okay. It's not a fixed sign. That's a mutable sign. It's changing. Okay. Cancer is a water sign related to feelings. So cancer is a good time to do rituals concerning like family and being home and fertility. That's so funny. Okay. I just, I know I conceived both my child's two of my children in cancer, which is really funny. Okay, Leo is a fire sign whose energy is really great for performing spells and doing intention works around courage, leadership, and career. Virgo is an earth sign ruled by Mercury. So it has a really high mental capacity. So Virgo is really good at performing rituals with detail. Okay, and you can use any moon in Virgo energy to do health, healing, and education spells and intention work. Libra is an energy that is conducive to balancing extremes. So rituals involving relationships, balance, partnerships, romance, they're really great with Libra. Libra is also ruled by Venus. Okay, so that's part of the reason why. Scorpio, when you're working with the moon in Scorpio, it's a time to do work with psychic powers, divination, and this will be your more advanced rituals. Okay, because Scorpio deals with death and change and uh, sex, and there's a lot of energy there, okay? So you can be performing really deep rituals, and I can't even tell you what they would be. But if you're like, oh, I want to do like some really heavy work of releasing, Scorpio is going to be your time. It's a water sign too. Sagittarius is a fire sign. It carries a strong intellectual influence. So this is really good for performing um, anything around education, truth, clarity, legal issues, protection, travel. You know, that's it's a great sign. Capricorn is a really stable Earth sign. And it's really great. For, and it's ruled by Saturn. So it's really great for performing any intentions, magic, or work around organization, stability, work, ambition, uh, moving ahead, you know, money for, you know, all those kind of abundance things. Aquarius moons are great for casting spells around friendships, overcoming addiction, psychic work. They're really great for like thinking differently and creatively. Pisces is an optimal time because they're a water sign to just be working with like magic of and, and divination work and intention setting around clairvoyance, lucid dreaming, dream work, divination, communication, any of the psychic stuff. Like this is a great time to do readings and just be really in the flow. Okay. Now the other um, full moons, like each moon has its own energy too and that can be really fun to look at and and work with but hopefully that helps i mean you know you can also look at the wheel of the year um the eight shabbats that are around the pagan wheel and the grarian calendar to look at also what work can be done at that time Suzanne asked, and, and Daniel also asked this, but Suzanne asked, I know this info is probably somewhere, but can you talk about what retrograde means? And then Danielle said, like, what are planet retrogrades and the impacts they have? Okay, so let's talk about retrograde um, because I throw that around a lot. I know what it means. I know a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people just assume you know what it means, but retrograde means basically from an astronomical perspective perspective that a planet appears to be moving backward in the sky. Now, the key word here is the word appears because that's not actually what's happening. Planets don't slow down. They don't stop and change direction. What we're basing this on is that everything is happening from the perspective of you being on Earth, okay? So planets don't do this, but depending on their speed and distance from Earth, they can appear to us as they're moving backwards. Okay. And again, this is the snapshot from Earth where you are, which is why when people ask for your astrological birth chart, they ask for the exact time and where you were located because it's based on where you were located on how you saw the sky or how, what the sky looked like at that time. 
Okay. So like, for example, I was born um, at, you know, a certain time, but I'm an identical twin. So I, I am six minutes younger. Suck that, Kelly. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, my sister's Kelly uh, is born six minutes older than me. Right. But our charts are like almost identical. I recently did this. I, I printed the, or kind of put them both on a sheet and I compared them. And the only difference is some of our planets lie in different houses because in that six minute difference, the sky changed. Okay. So in reality, like my sister and I are like a lot of similar things, but we're so different in other ways. And it's because of where our planets lie in what house. All right. Now that doesn't have anything to do with retrograde, but just interesting to note that anytime you're thinking about astrology, it's where you are in relation to the planets. Okay. That's important. So the best way I can explain retrograde is that it's like when you're at a stop sign and someone drifts next to you in another car drifts forward and you're on the brake, but because they're, they're changing it may feel like you're actually moving backward and then actually have that like sinking feeling in your stomach like you are moving. Are you moving? No, but your perception perception is altered due to the difference in speed with your card and the other card. So this is similar what happens with retrograde. Because of our planetary movement and that planetary movement, it looks like the planet's moving backwards and it can feel like you're moving backwards. So generally, retrogrades are times for reflection. Issues can arise because that that unnerving feeling that you're moving backward, okay? So astrologers tend to recommend that this is a time to like reflect on the past so you can evaluate what's happening in the now. Now, planets are different with retrogrades, like some last longer. Some happen many times a year. For example, Mercury goes retrograde three to four times a year. So we're going to hear about Mercury retrograde a lot. And the planets closest to us affect us more deeply. Mercury, Mars, Venus. Those retrogrades tend to bring the issues, people, and opportunities back around to us. Okay, so it's almost like past stuff comes up in our presence so that we have to deal with it. Now, because Mercury represents communications, learning, thinking, how we talk to people, how we hear things, um, reasoning, Mercury comes up and we're encouraged to do that communication work during Mercury retrograde. We're not, we're encouraged to not sign any contracts, for example, to like withhold our, that email that when we're really angry, you know, till after Mercury retrograde, just sit on it for a minute. Okay. When Venus goes Mercury, what uh, goes Mercury? When Venus goes retrograde, which happens approximately every 18 months and lasts for six weeks, we're looking at love life because that's what Venus rules. So we often are looking at old relationship issues that we thought were done that kind of come back around. And we kind of look at like comfort and self care and all those things. So, you know. Uh, Mars, which is retrograde right now, is a planet that deals with like our anger and our way of like moving forward, right? Um, it is an interesting retrograde because we have to look at like what gets us angry. Those are our teaching moments, you know. So when Mars goes direct, we end up having like a really good focus on how to like achieve our goals and what we've been struggling with and why it's important for us to either move through that or to release something around it. Now, when Jupiter goes retrograde, it is about a third of the year that Jupiter goes retrograde and it's 120 days. It's not going to affect us as much, but Jupiter is said to kind of bring that luck and, and abundance to wherever it is on your chart. So Jupiter is one of those gentle retrogrades because the goal is just to like bring us goodness. So it kind of like helps us get a like jump start on that place where Jupiter is in our planet. So it reminds us to like keep working towards our dreams. Okay. And we look at complacency during that time. Now, Neptune retrograde, which is one of the farther, you know, farther out, spends 23 weeks every year 
in retrograde. That's like 43% of the year. And when in retrograde, Neptune teaches us how we deceive ourselves, how we suppress our fears, how we manage our anxieties, how we are attached to things that are unhealthy for us. So when Neptune's moving direct, it it can distort reality um, in some ways because it kind of puts on these like rose colored glasses in retrograde. It kind of makes us see clearly take off those glasses and just like take what's happening. So sometimes Neptune retrograde can be very welcome because it helps us clarify um, what's going on. Saturn retrograde is similar to Jupiter in that it's like a third of the year it's in retrograde. So this, when we, we see retrograde, some astrologers like will be like, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> um, because Saturn is a taskmaster and it sort of like is all about the rules and keeping us in line and how to accomplish our goals. And it sort of like is always about structure, structure, structure. So, you know, when it goes retrograde, we get a little bit of a lesson, uh, a, sorry, a break from those lessons. And it helps us to kind of be a little, um, less task mastery with ourselves. Now Uranus retrograde is sort of the revolutionary of the zodiac. It's 22 weeks in retrograde during the year and that helps us take like a break. Okay, we are like not always being like the revolutionary during those times and it can be very helpful. Um, it's a good time for us to kind of like look at our energy and, and look creatively. So Uranus is great. It's, it's a, ch it's a changing, it's a planet that causes change. So you want to look at it where it's at in your chart, but it also when it's retrograde, it helps us to just be like present with what we're going through. Now, Pluto retrograde. Now, Pluto is one of those planets that, you know, they said is no longer a planet, but astrologers still use it as a planet in your chart. And, Pluto is like half the year in retrograde. And so Pluto, you know, we evaluate our relationship with power. So like, how are we stepping into our power? How are we stepping away from our power? All of those things. So it's really important when Pluto is in retrograde to like be thinking about our relationship to power. So that's kind of the retrograde skinny. And I hope that help. helped. Thanks for listening to Centered with me, Angie Yinkst. If you'd like to send me a question or comment about this show or any shows, you can send them to angie at themoonandstone.com.